Hello, everybody. Welcome. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> so sorry. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. If it looks like I just got up, rolled out of bed, sat down in front of this camera in the same clothes I slept in, that is inaccurate. I definitely put makeup on too. I definitely like put makeup on. But yes, these are the same clothes I wore. It is like a scorcher out there today, man. It is like 135 degrees in the shade. All right. So I put my hair in braids and I'm just going to wear this t-shirt because it's light. It's breezy. And yeah, I wear it to bed because it's cozy. And I like being in my cozies. This is the third and final part of the Michael Rockefeller series. If you have not seen the first two videos in this series yet, I've linked them in the description box. You should definitely watch those videos first. Otherwise, this one will make no sense. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, it's going to be a long one. All right, grab a snack, grab a drink, grab like a sandwich, maybe like, oh, like a, a granola bowl with some like yogurt and fruit, you know, whatever it is that you need because we got a lot to talk about. We have to talk about the search for Michael. We got to talk about the men in the background who were pulling everyone's strings, trying to make sure that the narrative that was going to come out wasn't going to be one that made any of them look bad. And we also have to talk about, you know, the often complicated family dynamics of the Rockefeller family. Because I guess the more money you have, like, kind of the more messed up you get, right? It kind of there's like a correlation. I'm just being a little hyperbolic, but maybe not. And we absolutely need to go over the theories because there are some good ones and there are some bad ones, but in their badness, they are good. And I want to know which one you think is the most plausible. So let's just have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video before we dive in. And the sponsor today is Surfshark VPN. I always say it and I'll say it again. If you are not using a VPN, you really should be for so many reasons, safety being the most paramount, the most important. And in my opinion, there's no better option than Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a modern VPN. It's designed with the user in mind, which means that not only are their utilities powered by robust security mechanisms, which means they're going to keep you safe on the internet, but they're also designed to be simple and intuitive to use, which is the only reason I can use it. It's also jam-packed with features that keep you and your personal information safe while you're on the internet. I always talk about how Surfshark VPN keeps you safe from hackers and nefarious figures on the internet, keeps your information safe, protects you from phishing attempts, things like that. I mean, the internet right now is the wild, wild west. There is so much stuff going on. Just in uh, the last part of this video that I posted, I was going through the comments and there was all these comments from people whose username said Stephanie Harlow and whose picture looked like my profile picture, but it was not me. And they were trying to get like my people, my, you know, people watching the video in the comment section to click on these links and stuff. So like you really need to be protected on the Internet because it's crazy out there. But I don't know if I spend enough time talking about the benefits that Surfshark VPN has for like entertainment. So when I was in London, the stuff that they have on Netflix in the UK is different than what they offer in the US. So I started binging this show when I was in London at night and it's called The Royals um, on the UK Netflix. But then I got back to the States and like the same night I got back, I was like, oh, I'm going to shower, put my skincare on. I'm going to get in bed. I, I got to, you know, keep watching the Royals because I'm obsessed now. They didn't have it on my U.S. Netflix. Now, listen, the Royals, it's a bad show. You know, it's one of those like guilty pleasures, soap opera kind of things, really overly dramatic, just bad, but also so, so good. I needed to find out what happened to Prince Leon and Princess Eleanor. Was their father, the king, going to make it out of his coma? Was their evil Uncle Cyrus going to take over the kingdom? I had to find out. And, and I didn't have it. So I just used Surfshark VPN to make it look like I was in the UK. And I was able to answer all my burning questions about the royals, which I have now completely binged. It's over. And I'm very sad. Uh, very sad. With Surfshark VPN, you can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix libraries. And it works for tons of other streaming services like Disney Plus and Hulu as well. Best of all, 
One subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at the same time. And when they say unlimited, they really mean it. My husband has it on his phone and his computer. My kids all have it on their tablets. My mom has it on her computer and her phone. I've got it on every single device that I own and use. Surfshark also has amazing customer service, which is available 24-7. So there's always someone there when you need them. And they have a strict no logs policy, unlike most internet service providers who log your activity, who sell your information, things like that. Surfshark VPN never keeps your data. I really think you should be using Surfshark VPN for a million reasons. So if you want to check it out for yourself, I've got a great deal for you. For a limited time, you can get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months of Surfshark VPN plus their new antivirus feature. The antivirus feature scans for viruses and malware on your devices, and it offers real-time protection to help maintain your security and your privacy when you download, install, or use programs and files. And this is very important for me because I'm always downloading PDFs, and sometimes I'm downloading from like sketchy places on the internet, like information people are sharing, and I really need it, and I really want to see it, but I'm like, oh, should I be downloading this? Super important. You can also schedule your scans for whenever you want, so it fits really easily into your life. All you have to do to get this amazing deal is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month, literally a steal, so you can browse securely on all your devices. Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year plan, plus three extra months, plus... Surfshark's new antivirus feature. Thank you so much to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video and keeping me safe on the internet. And let's dive in. Before I start, I just wanted to say to um, research and write this series, I used several sources. Um, I read two books. First, I read the book Savage Harvest by Carl Hoffman, which I've referenced a few times over the course of these videos. I also read the book When Grief Calls Forth the Healing, written by Mary Rockefeller Morgan, who was Michael Rockefeller's twin sister. I used a lot of online sources, um, writings from missionaries who spent time in New Guinea, travel people. People who spent time in New Guinea, as well as Michael's own writings. And I wanted to pop all of those in there just for anyone who was wondering. I also used some um, government websites and stuff because all of this um, information about Papua New Guinea and like the Dutch and the U.S. and Indonesian independence and stuff like that, that's all laid out for you on government websites, like they tell you all about that stuff, which is super interesting. And some of it was previously not released and now it is released. So I will link all of that stuff in the description box because I got a lot of questions about my sources. So if you wanna look further into these things for yourself or you're just kind of wondering how I put these videos together, there you have it. Those sources along with my blood, my sweat and my tears. So we are picking up on Sunday, November 19th, 1961, when Nelson Rockefeller, who was staying at his North Terrytown estate outside of New York City, he got a call that would forever change his life as well as the lives of his family. So remember Nelson Rockefeller is Michael Rockefeller's father, and at this time he was the governor of New York State. So in her book, Mary Rockefeller recalled how her father summoned herself and her two older brothers to the home, and she was obviously wondering, you know, what is this all about? And she kind of felt that maybe Nelson wanted to talk to them about his decision to marry his new girlfriend, something he'd announced just two days before during a press conference. According to Mary, quote, My brothers and I were still reeling from the family fracture, trying to make sense of our own feelings, trying to support our mother, end quote. So obviously there's already sort of a family scandal happening, some issues in the family, and that's kind of keeping their minds busy. They've already got this going on, and Mary's not thinking it could possibly be about anything else. But when Mary saw her father, she said he had a yellow cable in his hand, and when his children had gathered, he made his announcement with a grim face, saying, quote, I have troubling news. This morning, the State Department wired me. I just finished talking to them at Uncle David's. They received word from the Dutch government in New Guinea. They don't know the specifics yet, but Mike is missing, end quote. 
Everyone was obviously stunned and confused, but Mary said she was slightly comforted because her father Nelson was a man of action, and he'd already formulated a plan. He was leaving that night to fly to New Guinea, and he would arrive there to help coordinate search efforts and mobilize the necessary support. Now, I interpret this as Nelson wanting to remind the authorities in New Guinea that he was an important person, a politically connected person who had a great deal of influence in certain circles, and therefore the search for his son should reflect that. While in New Guinea, Nelson planned to charter a seaplane so that he could visit the coastal villages where the people who had known Michael lived, and once there, Nelson would talk to the locals and search for information, because if Michael had made it to the shore, they would be the ones who knew it. Mary quickly stated her intention to accompany her father to New Guinea, writing in her book, quote, I began to develop my own vision. Father and I would travel together to this foreign land. We would search and we would find Michael. I could even see him when we found him, disheveled, valiant, and even a bit surprised at our concern. Not easily prone to warrior fear, he would have surmounted the obstacles and landed on his feet as he always had. In a fleeting fantasy, I became the princess, departing with my father, the king, to find the lost prince, soon to be reunited in twinship as it was meant to be. End quote. So Mary Rockefeller, she had what we call main character energy. Am I right? Nelson Rockefeller would go to New Guinea accompanied by his daughter Mary, as well as Robert Gardner, who, if you remember, was the guy responsible for the Dead Birds documentary, you know, the Harvard guy. And he'd volunteered to go on the trip because he claimed he was familiar with the terrain. Um, they also had Elliot Elisafin from Life magazine with them and Robert McManus, who was Nelson's press secretary. There was also a handful of trusted aides along for the ride. But what Mary didn't know is she would also be forced to face a horde of reporters from the moment they arrived at the airport and basically for the duration of her stay in New Guinea. The Chicago Tribune was among the many publications who were lying in wait at the airport, and they would later write, quote, Hours after the report was received, a pale and shaken Governor Rockefeller boarded a jet on the first leg of a 10,000 miles flight to the primitive jungle area, end quote. Nelson addressed the reporters who were waiting at the terminal, and he told them he had just received a letter from his son Michael the week before, a letter that stated Michael's intent to be home by Christmas. Nelson claimed that he was certain Michael's training in the Army Reserves would have taught him to take care of himself, and Michael was also in excellent physical condition. The whole family used to do push-ups every morning before breakfast, which sounds like fun, said no one ever. Like, before breakfast? Without food or coffee in me to give me energy? Come on. Additionally, Nelson said that Michael was a very, very strong swimmer. He was able to swim long distances without getting tired, and he would likely be very capable of looking after himself if he happened to find himself in the jungle. After leaving New York, the group spent the night in San Francisco before going on to Hawaii and then across the Pacific to New Guinea. Now, Mary talks about how they chartered a plane to bring them there, and they were once again surrounded by reporters in the Hawaii airport. But then when she got on the plane, she found out that it was filled with more reporters, journalists that Nelson Rockefeller had actually invited to be there. In her book, Mary wrote, quote, Father turned and spoke again, welcoming the seated reporters, telling them about the journey ahead, introducing them, revealing his plans for our private, now public search for Michael, our Michael, and I thought fiercely, my Michael, not theirs. I felt that these reporters, with their questioning and analyzing, these reporters seemed to siphon father's quiet words from his own mouth into their notebooks. They were stepping on and into our very private lives, into our mission, as if they were trying to claim it before it could carry itself out on its own. I didn't dare ask father why we had to charter such a large plane or why he felt it necessary to play host to this swelling group of press. His arrangements confused, dispirited, and even angered me. I must have displaced the anger I felt then at father onto the press. End quote. So my question, I guess, would be the same kind of question that Mary had. Why did the press have to be there for this? Was Nelson Rockefeller using his son's disappearance as a press op? 
you would think that in this moment, as you're desperately worried about your son and what fate might have befallen him, the last thing you would want is a bunch of reporters watching your every move, writing about every tear or concerned look. It just feels wrong. It feels exploitative and invasive. But (laughs) I'm not a Rockefeller. Unfortunately, or fortunately, in this case, um, maybe that's just how they roll. Maybe they're used to that. Maybe it's necessary for them. I don't know, but it could never be me. Because all it's going to take is one of those reporters to say something stupid about my kid. Who's missing? And you're getting knocked out, you know? So it would be the wrong kind of press op for me. Their caravan stopped to refuel at Wake Island, and from there they flew on to Bayak, where local Dutch officials and more press were waiting. And it's important to know and to understand what the papers were printing at this time, because, you know, everyone who ever visited Papua New Guinea or crossed paths with Michael Rockefeller, they're going to come out of the woodwork. They're going to come out of the woodwork to get their five minutes of fame or to start spinning their own narrative. It was reported that the Dutch officials had described the Asmat area near where Michael had vanished as a controlled one, meaning that it was relatively civilized. Sam Putnam, Michael's old friend from Exeter, who had been with Michael the previous summer in New Guinea, he told the press that the area was not considered hazardous and he didn't believe his friend was in any danger. But Robert Gardner, self-proclaimed expert of the area, he solemnly told the press that many of the tribes in the area were only a few years separated from their headhunting history and they still rated their prestige among their fellow tribesmen based on the number of enemies killed. Dutch military experts chimed in, claiming that the coastal waters through which Michael would have had to swim in order to make it to shore, they were infested with sharks and crocodiles. And the natives living along the coast, they could be unpredictable in their reaction to a strange white man. Dr. J. Bodenmaker, the deputy governor of Dutch New Guinea, he told one publication, quote, Michael Rockefeller has tried to reach Dutch New Guinea's most inhospitable shore, end quote. Bodenmaker also said that he had met and gotten to know Michael during Michael's time in New Guinea, and he claimed, quote, he was going after the headhunter relics along the coast of the Asmat territory. Michael wanted to buy carved ships, totem poles, and human heads from the local population, end quote. And this is the first time we ever hear any mention that Michael was interested in possibly purchasing human heads. There's no talk of it in his journals. Um, You see the things he's cataloged. There's no human heads there. As far as I know, he never sent any human heads back to New York City. But as I've said many times, if there ever had been, I'm sure the people who made his writings public would not have wanted that detail to be found out, especially after he went missing. The papers also reported that until recently, areas not far from the coast had been inhabited by some cannibals and headhunters. And just the prior weekend, Dutch officials had confirmed that a Dutch administrator and two native constables who had been friendly with the Dutch had been killed by what they had previously believed to be a friendly group of natives. And while Nelson Rockefeller and his crew were speeding towards New Guinea, there was a flurry of activity and communication happening between Dutch government officials. The Dutch ambassador to the United States sent a message to Joseph Lunds, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Netherlands. And remember, Lunds at this time was actually in New York at the UN General Assembly trying to convince them to let the Dutch remain in New Guinea and work on like installing their Netherlands friendly native government before abandoning the colony. Now this message said, quote, in connection with the enormous publicity to be expected, I need not point out to you, also with an eye to the still not unfavorable course of review of the Dutch proposals in the UN, It is of supreme importance to provide Rockefeller and the accompanying reporters with the most assistance possible from the Royal Navy. It should be prevented that Nelson Rockefeller and the reporters accompanying him get the impression that any reasonable option would have been neglected to find the missing person. End quote. Lunds forwarded this message to P.J. Platiel, the governor of Dutch New Guinea. Another cable from Theo Bott, who was the Dutch interior minister, it was also sent to the same group of officials, saying, quote, 
As a consequence of the tragic disappearance of Rockefeller Jr., the international press gives more attention to Dutch New Guinea than the opening of the New Guinea Council and the Dutch proposals in the UN could generate. We should turn this to our advantage as much as possible with an eye to the success of the Dutch proposals in the UN. In particular, I am thinking of, one, as much as possible, a unified response of the members of the New Guinea Council with regard to the future of Dutch New Guinea, two, self-control and loyalty of Dutch officials towards foreign guests, three, emphasize a modern development of Dutch New Guinea as opposed to picturesque primitivity of South Coast and Interior, four, highlight the idea of a nation in the making and real practical possibilities with regard to the future of Dutch New Guinea. End quote. So basically, let me sum it up. Don't say anything to make us look bad. In fact, focus on talking about how much good the Dutch have done for these primitive people. And don't talk too much about the natives and all of their crazy beliefs and practices. That's not the message we want to send right now because we want the United States to think that we have this place handled. So they'll keep letting us handle it. And it sucks that Michael Rockefeller floated away in the sea, but because he did, we have a lot of press here that normally wouldn't care about this area of the world. So let's not waste this opportunity, gentlemen. Theo Bot wanted to make sure that the Rockefellers and the media left New Guinea with only the best things to say about how the Dutch had conducted themselves and about how well their government there ran and how effective they were at getting things done, no matter how things with Michael turned out. They had it all under control in Dutch New Guinea. Why change everything up now as JFK and the UN were debating doing? Nelson and Mary Rockefeller arrived in Meraki, the Dutch outpost south of Azmat territory, and now the official base for the search for Michael Rockefeller. It was off the coast of Dutch New Guinea that Michael Rockefeller was last seen swimming to that inhospitable shore. His father, New York's millionaire governor, himself went out to look for his explorer son. But it was a desperate search. Nelson wanted to be flown over the area where Michael had last been seen. And then he wanted to be flown really low over the coast to see if they could spot Michael swimming or walking or whatever or any sign of him, right? Now Mary goes with him on the plane. And from her seat on the plane, Mary stared. She stared out her window with wide eyes. She was seeing the same thing her brother had seen when he first arrived in New Guinea, but where he had gazed out of his airplane window with amazement and excitement and intrigue, she took it all in with a growing anxiety. She said, quote, Below our window, as far as my eyes could see, stretched vast jungles seemingly uninhabited. They were punctuated by meandering rivers, some large, ending in huge, spreading deltas. I was struck by the lack of any clear boundary between the land and the ocean. As we dropped closer to the shoreline, we could see row upon row of waves moving in over shallow mud flats, which stretched for a mile or more before meeting the trees. The sun glinted off the water between their trunks until it was extinguished by thickening foliage. How could Michael find his way if he made it to shore? This swamp, this huge expanse of trees growing out of water, seemed impossible to navigate, end quote. So what she's saying is very valid, actually. I mean, when we think of, you know, somebody swimming in the ocean or the sea towards shore, we think of like a very um, Tom Hanks-like castaway kind of thing where there's like an ocean and then the waves go up on the sandy beach and you can just like you know, get close to shore and let the waves push you the rest of the way and you're good. You're climbing up on the beach. You're fine. That's not the case here. The water goes right into the jungles, right? The water goes right into the trees and you can't really see a shoreline. You'd have to get into this jungle area first and then navigate through that before you really got to somewhat dry land. Nelson and Mary also met with Rene Wassing, the man who had been with Michael out at sea when the young Rockefeller had vanished from sight. Now, Mary said that Rene's English was good, but he was still difficult to understand at times, and he seemed quite nervous as he spoke to them, his eyes constantly darting from Mary and her father to the Dutch officials that were with them. Mary said, quote, 
I sensed he felt responsible to them and could not be completely frank with father and me concerning what had happened to Michael, end quote. Now, something you need to know is that Michael's sister, Mary, does not think that anything strange or nefarious happened to her brother. But on this point, when she mentioned Renee being nervous, maybe not being completely honest about what he knew because of the presence of the Dutch officials, that's telling. And I think she was very astute on this point. By Tuesday, November 21st, land, sea, and air rescue forces had combed the coastal area, hoping to spot some sign of Michael Rockefeller. Dutch officials continued commenting to the press as they had been instructed to do. Dr. J. Bodenmaker told the papers, quote, We liked him very much. He was young, impulsive, and full of enthusiasm. I think he'll manage to get through. He's a strongly built lad and he had brains. Although I must say it was not wise to leave his boat for once he is on the coastline, it will be difficult to spot him from the air. Nevertheless, I believe the Dutch Navy will find him, end quote. So it's funny because he sort of goes back and forth in his statement. He refers to Michael in the past tense. He was a great kid. We liked him very much. And then he sort of like is like, oh, that's a little dark. Let me transition. And he's like, I think he's going to make it. He is a strong kid. Don't worry. And then he kind of goes back and he's like, but it wasn't a good idea to leave the boat. But then he goes back and he's like, however... <laughs> We have things under control. The Dutch Navy's going to find him. We've got this. There is that loyalty and unified message that Theobot was talking about, even though it took Bodenmaker a little bit while to get there. Another unnamed Dutch official seemed less optimistic, saying, quote, The coast is virtually unreachable. The sea is infested with crocodiles, and there are impenetrable marshes and dense thickets of mangrove bushes and roots, end quote. So we can sort of already see the narrative forming. Michael shouldn't have left his boat. The sea is dark and full of terrors. The land isn't even really land. It's basically just water and thick mud all around trees. Trees whose roots have grown so deep and so wide, you can't even get through them. We doubt he even made it to shore, and you can't prove that he did. American missionaries stationed on the south coast of Papua New Guinea also joined in helping to search for Michael, as well as many of the native tribes, including 2,000 men from the village of Etch. But do you know who wasn't looking for Michael Rockefeller? Anybody from the village of Otsjanap. By Wednesday, November 22nd, the bright optimism had started to fade a bit. Reporter Brian Hogden of the Sydney Mirror boarded a small plane that flew him at treetop height over the desolate area where Michael would have been heading when he left his catamaran. Hogden wrote grimly, quote, I am convinced only a miracle can save this rash young man, end quote. I don't understand, because a lot of people say this, I don't necessarily think what Michael did was rash, honestly. And this is just my personal opinion, right? But if you think about it, he and Renee were floating on that capsized catamaran for what probably felt like forever. They had no idea that Simon and Leo had gone to get help. Those boys could have swam to shore, went home, and went on with their lives. Michael was probably thinking they hadn't gone to get help, since no help had shown up. They were drifting further out to the sea. They had no food. They had no water. And if no one was coming to rescue them, like, what were they supposed to do? Just float until you, like, die from thirst or starvation? Just float until some big wave broke their already broken catamaran and they drowned? Like, what were they supposed to do? He felt that he needed to do something. And he could still see the coastline. So he thought he could make it, you know, and maybe that was their only hope of survival. If he didn't go now, then he would have just kept going out to sea until the coast was way further. And then by the time he decided like, oh, no one's coming, should probably swim to shore. It's going to be like 25, 30 miles away. You're definitely not going to make it then. But I don't know. Do you think he was rash or do you think he was just like someone's got to do something? And I am a Rockefeller. <laughs> no, do you think... What he did was rash, or do you think that it was probably like his only option at that point? Or at least he thought it was. Let me know in the comments. Now, those who were familiar with the area and that specific stretch of shoreline, they claimed that even if Michael had made it to shore, it could be 10 or more days before he was able to get word out to anyone. Mary wrote in her book that her father had mentioned to her that President Kennedy had offered to send a transport ship with Marines to help find Michael, but Nelson had declined this offer after some consideration. At that time, Mary didn't really question her father's decision because that's just not what she did. And you know, 
She thought he was the man with the plan, a man of action, a force greater than life itself. He knew what he was doing. However, later, Mary discovered that this decision may have been more political than strategic. And she said, quote, years later, I was told by an assistant to my father that the Dutch were afraid the search effort would uncover their strategic defenses hidden along the coast. End quote. I don't really even believe this reason, to be honest, because there was a lot of talk going around that time that if the Dutch had to take the help of the United States, it meant that they were incapable of handling things themselves and they didn't want it to look like that. Whatever the reason was for declining more manpower in a search where it definitely would have helped, it certainly wouldn't have hurt. It did seem to be a decision that Nelson agreed to at least because of politics and, like, international relations. As the end of the week neared, Nelson Rockefeller was clearly also feeling less hopeful about a happy outcome, saying, quote, I am a realist, and I know what he faced if he reached that jungle, end quote. Nelson announced his plans to leave New Guinea and return to New York the following Sunday, a date that would mark exactly one week from when his son had disappeared. I guess that's all the time Nelson had in his busy schedule, a week to look for your missing son, back to business as usual. You got a state to govern, right? Rockefellers ain't got no time for missing persons. Shit. The Dutch commissioner for New Guinea... F. Elbrink Jansen. He announced that he believed there was still a 50-50 chance that Michael would have, you know, been able to swim through the shark-infested waters and make it to the jungle. And he felt there was still hope because if Michael had drowned or been attacked by sharks, that would mean he would have lost the two gas cans he was using as flotation devices, right? Because sharks and crocodiles are not going to eat, like, metal gas cans. And those cans would have been carried to the shore by the current within six days. And those cans hadn't turned up yet, despite an intense search for any sign of Michael. If Michael had made it to land, and he was making his way through the dense jungle, Jansen believed that he could survive by drinking sago tree liquid and eating crabs. But then, on Friday, November 24th, a six-gallon red petrol tank was found floating close to the shore, 80 miles south of the spot where Michael had been last seen. The papers, who had been eager for a development, excitedly printed, quote, Authorities plan to have the tank, which is numbered, picked up by an Australian Catalina flying boat from a Dutch survey ship and taken to the service headquarters in Marrake. But officials already believe it is the one used by Michael Rockefeller to swim from a capsized catamaran last Sunday, end quote. A helicopter flying above the jungles had also spotted what they believed was a wisp of smoke spiraling from an area of jungle near the coast where Michael would have ended up. Now, as we know from Jansen's statement and from what we talked about like before, the gas cans being pushed to shore wouldn't really be a super good sign that Michael had made it out of the sea alive. However, Nelson Rockefeller, who most likely was looking for anything to grab onto in order to keep his hope alive, he announced that he believed the gas can was a sign that Michael could still be alive, that he had reached the shore and taken off his makeshift flotation device, leaving it behind before venturing into the jungle. I personally think if Michael had gotten to the shore and went into the jungle by himself, he probably would have brought the gas cans to, like, hold water in, you know, because Michael is somebody who might be thinking about that. Like, there's not a lot of water or liquid here. I might have to, like, milk the sago trees for something to drink, and I'll want something to keep that in. And maybe he would use the empty gas can for that, but maybe that's why only one was found, because he took one with him and left one on the shore. And then the water came and got it and pulled it, you know, a little bit out so that that's where it was found. I don't know. I don't know. But regardless, Nelson Rockefeller decided this was a sign of hope and he would stay in New Guinea a little bit longer. With the gas can and the wisp of smoke coming from the jungle, search crews focused their attention on this area of the coast. And two tree-level helicopters were sent out on Monday, November 27th to search a 10-mile coastal strip. Each helicopter held an interpreter so that they could land and question natives in the villages of that area, and officials reported that they believed Michael could have stumbled into an Azmat village, and the villagers were, like, keeping him there so that they could hand him over to the government when they came looking and not be blamed for his disappearance or even his possible death. But by the next day, Dutch officials announced that although the search efforts would continue, it was their belief that Michael was dead. 
and the exact details of his death may never be known. On that same day, the Rockefellers boarded a plane and flew home. Mary wrote in her book, quote, My fairy tale vision of finding Michael, the wonderful reunion of the king and his daughter with the valiant son prince, this shimmer myth, had burst in the air like a soap bubble the day we arrived, and the gallant, enthusiastic, problem-solving father had been replaced by an increasingly silent, weighted-down man, his blue-gray eyes barely visible, his strong jaw and mouth etched in grim downward lines. There was no evidence of Michael or his whereabouts, only one rusted red gasoline can. End quote. The massive publicity-fueled search ended in a whisper. The Dutch government in New Guinea announced officially that Michael Rockefeller had either drowned after being too tired to reach the shore, or he'd been the victim of a shark attack. But there are a lot of people who think that this was just the official story, the one that didn't make anyone look bad, I guess besides Michael, right? Poor kid had jumped into the sea and tragically didn't make it. Who could be mad at anyone besides Michael Rockefeller, that rash young man? So what are these theories? Let's first examine the official theory that Michael drowned or was eaten by sharks. Now, apparently, according to the newspaper articles in 1961, the Arafura Sea was known as one of the most shark-infested areas in the world. Now, Carl Hoffman, author of the book Savage Harvest, he's made some comments about sharks, and I don't know how easy they are to believe. First, he claims that sharks rarely attack humans, and I suppose... Like in a way that is accurate, according to OceanService.gov, only about a dozen of the more than 300 species of sharks have been involved in attacks on humans. Since sharks evolved millions of years before humans even existed, their natural diet doesn't really consist of people. Most sharks prefer to feed on smaller fish, invertebrates, and larger shark species like to eat seals, sea lions, and other marine mammals. And it's said that sometimes when sharks attack like people, they're mistaking them for a seal or a sea lion. Great white sharks, bull sharks, and tiger sharks account for most of the attacks on humans, so I downloaded this helpful PDF titled Sharks and Rays of Papua New Guinea to see what kind of species hangs out in those waters. I'll link it in the description box if you want to download it as well because it's really cool and you can even get a free copy sent to you if you want it like in person, but it's awesome. There was also a helpful little map like slash key thing, which showed each region of New Guinea so you can figure out which sharks are known to hang out in those specific regions. And let's just say, they got lots of sharks, man. They got lots of sharks. And this is why I don't swim in the ocean, among many other reasons, but this is one of them. Yeah, they got great white sharks. They got bull sharks. They also have this shark called the silver tip shark, which is a pretty big species of shark. And they are known to hang out around offshore reefs, even though as far as I could tell, They've only been held responsible for one unprovoked attack on a human, but yes, there are known shark attacks in this area, and there have been 48 reported shark attacks there since 1848. But that's actually a small number compared to many, many other places. South Carolina has had 107 shark attacks since 1837. Brazil has had 107 since 1931. California has had 130 shark attacks since 1926. Hawaii has had 159 since 1829. South Africa has had 259 since 1905. And get this, the shark attack capital of the world is Florida, with a whopping 895 reported shark attacks between 1882 and 2021. That's bananas. Like, if I was going to swim anywhere in the ocean, I probably would have said, like, Florida, because everybody goes in the ocean in Florida. But now, that's off limits for me, too. So Carl Hoffman believes that if Michael had been attacked by sharks, he would have not been completely consumed. And something, you know, affiliated with him would have washed up on the shore. And this attack would have happened within the first few days after his disappearance. So all the planes and boats that were out looking for him in those days, they would have spotted something like his gas can flotation devices, which the sharks would obviously not have eaten, or a piece of the rope that he had used to tie the cans to him. Hoffman writes, quote, In the end, the chance that he was attacked and consumed by sharks so completely that neither he nor the rope or belt or other gas tank was found is low, end quote. And I guess that that same reasoning goes along with the idea that Michael had drowned. 
if he had had the gas tanks attached to him, he wouldn't have drowned while they were on him, at least. Now, is it possible he lost one and it floated away? I suppose. But if that's the case, where did the other one go? Because he had two with him. Now, the second theory is one that I came across while I was researching the story, and I thought it was kind of funny. So I decided to throw it in here. Michael Rockefeller is not dead, folks. He is Tom Hanks. He's Tom Hanks. The basis of this theory is essentially Michael and Tom both wear glasses. They look kind of similar, but not too similar because after Michael Rockefeller faked his disappearance, he got cosmetic surgery and then reinvented himself as Tom Hanks, even though Tom Hanks was five years old when Michael vanished. So that's not a real theory. You know, I just had to tell you about it because it's silly. It's kind of silly, but it would make sense as to why Tom Hanks was so good in Castaway. You know, he lived through it. He wasn't acting. He lived it. Anybody? Okay, the next theory is that Michael Rockefeller didn't drown or get eaten by sharks. He made it to land and he became part of a tribe living out the rest of his days with this tribe. In 2011, Frazier Heston, who is Charlton Heston's son, he filmed a documentary called The Search for Michael Rockefeller. Now, in my opinion, if the Tom Hanks theory is a 9 out of 10 on the unbelievable scale, this theory that Michael like just lived with the natives and didn't want to go home is like a 6 out of 10. And that may simply be because this documentary was so dramatic and over the top. I felt like I was watching an episode of Ancient Aliens. And I mean, there may be something to it, though, even though I really think we need to consider the source on this one. And that source is a man named Milt Macklin. Milt Macklin was an American journalist, author, and adventurer who worked as the editor for Argozi magazine, a pulp fiction magazine. If you've been watching me for a while, you probably remember from past videos that we've done, pulp fiction magazines were cheap, fictional publications that printed stories about amazing and crazy things that were completely made up, but also incredibly thrilling. Milt Macklin is best known for coining the terms Bermuda Triangle and Abdominable Snowman. So I feel like we're definitely in ancient alien territory here. In fact, I believe in ancient aliens more than I believe in the Abominable Snowman. But anyways, Milt Macklin, he was interested in Michael Rockefeller's disappearance and his magazine printed an extensive story about it, which is possibly what prompted him to get what he called a rough-looking visitor to his New York City office on October 12th, 1968. The rough-looking character told Milt that his name was John Donahue. He was a Tasmanian who operated throughout the Indonesian islands as a smuggler, and he claimed to have information about the missing Rockefeller son. So, of course, Milt Macklin and John Donahue have to leave the office and go to a bar in the city called the Blarney Stone because conversations like this need to happen over a drink. And that's a fact. That's that on that, you know. Donahue said he'd been sailing through the northern coast of New Guinea near the Trobriand Islands. And he and his crew of smugglers, they'd seen a village on the banks of one of these islands. And out of one of the thatched roof huts on stilts, they saw a white man emerge. This man was having a hard time walking because apparently he was healing from having two broken legs. He had long hair and a sandy beard, and when he saw Donahue and his crew, he became excited. Donahue told Milt Macklin, quote, The man was excited. I could see that. He was squinting at us, something fierce. I reckon he had real bad eyes. He struggled towards us, extended his hand, and said, I'm Michael Rockefeller. Can you help me? End quote. Of course, this man, John Donahue, has to be like, this man was squinting at us. He has bad eyes. Because Michael Rockefeller wears glasses, right? So this is a little something that can add to the believability of the story, add some context, add some texture like a good storyteller would. Now, this man, who Donahue alleges was claiming to be Michael, he told Donahue that after his catamaran had collapsed, he had swam towards land for hours. When he staggered ashore, exhausted, he was rescued by a group of Azmat villagers near Ostjanap. But these villagers were then attacked by a raiding party of Trobriand Islanders, who then took Michael hundreds of miles back to their home island. When a nefarious character came to call, an Australian smuggler named Donahue, what would you say if I told you I saw Michael Rockefeller alive 10 weeks ago? He asked Donahue for further details. Where was the island? What was the name of it? He had an approximation of the name, Kanapua or, or, or something like that. Turns out Donahue actually had the latitude and longitude of the island. He looks it up on the map. They're at 108 degrees east, 5 degrees south. 
is an island called Kanapua. And that was in the Trobriand Islands, which is about 800 miles from where Michael had disappeared, which seems very far-fetched, but just so far-fetched that it could actually be real. What does she mean? just so far-fetched that it could be real? Like, where on the far-fetched scale is the sweet spot where it could just be real? So, John Donahue, which is a made-up name if I've ever heard one, allegedly, just my opinion, he said he would have rescued Michael Rockefeller, but it was too risky, too much of a chance, because the natives, they were treating Michael fine. They kind of looked at him as a trophy, sort of, to have him in their midst, but they were not going to allow him to leave. So Milt Macklin asked John Donahue, like, have you gone to the Rockefeller family with this information? Because they'd probably give you a pretty large reward if you help them find Michael. But John Donahue said no, because he's just trying to do the right thing here. He just wants to do the right thing for once. Milt Macklin claims that Donahue told him that he didn't want any reward. He'd been a criminal all of his life, and he just wanted to help someone for a change. And besides, he had promised the kid that he would do all he could to get him back home. Milt knew a good story when he saw one. He went to his editor and he said, look, if by the remotest flight of fancy this story should turn out to be true, and Michael Rockefeller is alive somewhere in the jungles of New Guinea, somebody's got to find him. I want to be that guy. We found out that there was footage that Milt had taken. It's in the book. It's like in the first chapter. He went down, hired a cinematographer, and took two cameras and 10,000 feet of film. I thought, wait a second, where is this film? I looked on the internet, I looked in the Library of Congress, it just didn't have a record. So Milt Macklin did write a book about his experiences searching for Michael, a book that is the same name as the documentary that Fraser Heston would later create after he got the rights to Milt Macklin's book. And Fraser Heston would also become friendly with Milt's widow, Margaret. And one day, Heston was asking Margaret, you know, where did all of Milt's video footage go? The footage he refers to having a photographer take in his book. And I said, Margaret, what, did he edit this film, you know, ever? Did he finish the film? She said, no, he never did anything with it. And we gave it to a stock footage house. They went out of business. I became a detective for six months. And eventually I called a stock footage house and asked them if they'd heard of this footage. They said, yes. You mean the Milt Macklin footage from the search for Michael Rockefeller in New Guinea? I said, yeah, have you got it? They said, no, we don't, but we know who does. It was in storage in Vermont. Three months later, I get three giant moving cartons full of about 15 reels of 16 millimeter film. So they're going through all this film and they come across footage of 600 Azmat warriors rowing canoes. And with them in one of the canoes, they saw a white man. Here is that footage. Malcolm Kirk was there and he films this Azmat Armada that's going by quickly, just like this. So there must have been six, eight hundred, a thousand warriors directly toward the camera, shaking their spears and chanting and shooting off ceremonial arrows, which may be ceremonial, but they're still sharp. In the midst of this appears paddling, stark naked, an obviously Caucasian man dressed in azmat feathers, paddling his spear paddle alongside 10 or 20 of his azmat fellows. So this footage was allegedly taken in 1969, eight years after Michael disappeared. And Heston ran with this story. He did a whole documentary on it. If you want to see the film, you can actually watch it for free on Tubi, which is what I ended up doing. Um, not sponsored by Tubi, but while you're there, you can also watch the new documentary about the Green River Killer, Sins of the Father, which I am featured heavily in. Just saying, Tubi, yay. Anyways, Frazier Heston obviously doesn't know if this white man in the Azmat canoe was actually Michael Rockefeller, but... You know, it could have been, I guess, but it also could have just been like another missionary, right? We had missionaries like um, Father Van de Waal and uh, Gerard Zegward who dressed like the natives, who rode in canoes with them, who grew their hair and their beards long. It could have just been an, another missionary, somebody who was living amongst the tribes. This was 1968, so they were still there. Um, but after doing his own research and going over everything that Milt Macklin had put together, Fraser Heston still kind of came to his own theory about what had happened to Michael. And it is a theory that author Carl Hoffman shares and a theory he wrote extensively about in his book, Savage Harvest. And that is the next theory that we're going to discuss. 
And I will say, when it comes to reliable sources, I'm far more inclined to believe Carl Hoffman than Milt Macklin. Hoffman has published multiple nonfiction books. He was a contributing editor for National Geographic. He has published articles in Smithsonian Magazine. He's won several journalism awards. He doesn't seem like the sensationalist sort of type. He's clearly done his research for all his work, including this book. And Hoffman has also traveled on assignment to 80 countries, so he's like a boots-on-the-ground kind of journalist, you know, a real Ernest Hemingway type. So Hoffman actually spent years searching through documents, living with the Azmat people, trying to learn their language, and also talking to multiple people who were connected to Michael Rockefeller. He really did put in the work before delivering his thoughts to the world, and I highly suggest that you check out his book because it goes a lot deeper and it gives a lot more information than I could ever include in the series. It's incredibly well-written, incredibly well-researched. You can tell that he really devoted his life to this topic for, a, for quite a while. So Carl Hoffman believes that Michael Rockefeller did make it to shore, where he was quickly killed and eventually eaten by a group of men from the village of Oats Janap. And to be fair, he's got a lot of evidence to back that up, so let's talk about what he found. After Michael went missing, rumors began circulating around the Azmat villages, and those rumors made it to the ears of missionaries who were living amongst the natives. Father Van Kessel had a native assistant named Gabriel who'd been baptized and who had been with the priest for years. And during the search for Michael, Gabriel was on the ground. He was going to different villages, trying to find out if anyone knew anything about where Michael might be. And he arrived in the village of Oatsjanip on November 27, 1961. And many of the Azmat who lived there, they'd never seen helicopters or like these huge ships in the sea before. And so they were scared about all of this stuff they'd never seen before. And, you know, I can imagine, like, I'm trying to put myself in their position in their shoes. That would be super scary. When I see helicopters and stuff flying really low, I already get scared because for me, it's like an ominous sign. But if you've never even seen that before, it would definitely seem very ominous. So they ran into the jungle because they were scared. Gabriel went looking for them, and eventually two villagers named Ajim and Finn came to talk to him. And they told him they didn't know anything about Michael. But Gabriel noticed that no one from Otsjanap was helping in the search. However, Gabriel had heard a story from the village of Warkai, which was located close to Otsjanap up the river. And the villagers there had told him that a white man had been pulled from the water by a group of Oats Janep men, and he had been killed. These rumors had come from a villager in Oats Janep named Beer, who'd been visiting Warkai after Michael had vanished. So basically, Beer leaves Oats Janep, he goes to Warkai, he starts running his mouth, right? Gabriel told Father Van Kessel what he had heard, and Van Kessel sent Gabriel back to Oats Janep on December 3rd to see if he could get more information now that the villagers had all returned from hiding in the jungle because the search for Michael was basically over and at least the helicopters were like grounded. Gabriel went to each ewe in the village and he told the men there about what Bear had been claiming. And one villager named Wotim told Gabriel that they had seen something in the water. They'd seen a fierce giant snake in the sea, but they hadn't seen a white man. None of the other men knew anything. But as Gabriel was asking questions, Bear began running through the village screaming that he hadn't told anyone anything, and then he ran into the jungle and hid. So Father Van Kessel wanted to get to the bottom of it. He had Gabriel bring Bear and three other Oatsjanep warriors, Wotim, Ator, and Ikab, back to his house in the village of Basim to ask them some questions himself, and they arrived on December 5th. And Wotim, who had told Gabriel that he'd seen a giant snake in the water, he now claimed, no, it wasn't a snake. It was just a piece of wood. Bear told Father Van Kessel that he'd made the whole story up, and Ator said that he had seen a giant crocodile in the sea. Another man, Ecob, told Van Kessel that he thought he'd seen a man in the water, or at least something with a face, but it had just been a tree trunk. Now, something I picked up when reading this was the fact that the Azmat believe they come from trees, that people come from trees. So this may have been a way that the villagers could tell Van Kessel their story without really lying about it because a tree could be in reference to a person. So Van Kessel asked Ator, like, you know, if you saw this giant crocodile in the water, why didn't you kill it? And Ator said, well, we didn't have any weapons on us, so we didn't kill it, which is not believable, right? Because these Azmat men, they don't ever leave the village without 
their spears and things to protect themselves. When Father Van Kessel asked to speak to Wotum again, the villager who had changed his story from seeing a giant snake in the sea to only seeing a tree, Wotum ran into the jungle and hid. So Father Van Kessel sent his assistant Gabriel back to Ostjnap with a bunch of tobacco, hoping that the asthmat men's favorite substance would loosen their tongue a bit. Gabriel did something that cops do, right? He sort of twisted the truth to see if he could get the villagers to admit that they had in fact seen Michael after he'd gone missing. Gabriel told them that the government was searching for a white man, and they knew that a body had washed up near this village. The men of the village had probably found the body, but they hadn't known what to do with it, and they hadn't told anyone because they didn't want to be blamed for Michael's death. So all they had to do was give Gabriel some proof that they had found Michael's body so that the government would stop looking for him and they could go away and life could return to normal. Still, everyone in the village claimed to know nothing, but a villager named Pep did have a new dagger made from human bone, and he didn't need his old one anymore, so he gave it to Gabriel. Gabriel returned to Van Kessel to report on what had happened, and Van Kessel would later say in a report that the Asmat were, quote, acting, People exaggerated their amazement, and they gave cautious answers. Behind his back, they were whispering, and they were really nervous, end quote. Now, another missionary was also hearing rumors. Father Von Piège was doing his rounds through the villages in the week after Michael had disappeared, and he arrived in Otsjinap on December 9th, at which point he was told that there were some men who wanted to see him. Four asthmat men walked into his little hut. Bear, who, if you remember, was responsible for the original rumor being spread around, and Booms, who was also from the village of Otsjinap. The two other men, Majubi and Tatsji, were both from Omisdep, but they had relatives in Otsjinap, and Tatsji had actually accompanied Michael and Renee Wassing on their first trip through Asmat territory the previous summer. So even though Otsjinap and Omisdep were rival villages who were constantly at war, the fact that these two individuals had relatives in Otsjinap meant that they were untouchable and they couldn't be harmed while they were there. Now, these four men had a crazy and detailed story to tell. They claimed that on November 17th, they had heard that Wim Vandiwal in Piramapun was requesting some building materials. Now, if you remember, we briefly talked about Vandiwal, um, Wim Vandiwal. He was the Dutch patrolman, and he'd actually sold Michael the catamaran. And this Friday was the same Friday that Michael and Renee had left a Gatz heading to Purr to check on the progress of the canoe that Michael was having carved for him. So, villagers from Otsjinep, they got the building materials together, 50 of them got into their canoes, and they rowed off, delivering the stuff to Vandy Wall on Saturday. These same 50 men got back into their canoes late Sunday afternoon to head back home, and by Monday morning, at around 6 a.m., they paused to have a smoke at the mouth of the Utah River. Now, according to a mutual understanding between Asmat villages, the mouth of every river belongs to the village that lies upstream of it. So this area where they stopped um, to pause and relax, it would have been safe for the villagers. They wouldn't have had to have been afraid of being attacked or ambushed because this was their territory. Now, Otsjinap and Omistap were located on parallel rivers, the Utah for Otsjinap and the Ferrets for Omistap. Anyways, these men are chilling, they're smoking, talking. All of a sudden, someone yells out that there's something moving in the water. Is it a crocodile? No, it's not. It's a man, a white man. The white man was swimming on his back. He seemed to be tired and friendly. He turned and waved at them but not every asthmat man was feeling so friendly back towards him. One of the men yelled out that they were always talking about headhunting white men. Well, now was their chance. The men argued amongst themselves. One of their leaders felt that this was a bad idea, but most of them were all for it. So as the men began lifting this white guy into their canoe, he was stabbed with a spear by a villager named Pep. This spear wound did not kill the white man, so they took him in their canoe to the Jorwar River, where they killed him, made a big fire. The four asthmat men telling Von Piège this story also claimed that the white man was wearing a strange pair of shorts, shorts they'd never seen before, that ended high on the man's legs and had no pockets. Shorts, which Carl Hoffman claims you couldn't even buy in a store in a Getz, which was the most westernized area in Asmat territory, so the Asmat men really wouldn't know how to describe these shorts unless they'd seen them. 
The shorts they were describing were men's underwear, which makes sense considering Renee Wassing told us that Michael had removed his pants before jumping into the sea. Now, Father Von Piège tried to remain calm. He didn't want to be like, what, and freak out and scare them. And he asked the men, like, oh, you know, was this guy wearing glasses? Like, where's his body? Things like that. And he was told that Michael's head, which was small, like the head of a child, it was hanging in the house of Finn in the village of Oztjenep. His thigh bones, which the Azmat would use to make daggers, had been claimed by Pep, who, remember, had a new dagger when Father Von Kessel's assistant Gabriel had arrived in the village asking questions about Michael. The other thigh bone had been claimed by a villager named Ajim. Michael's tibias had been claimed by two villagers named Jane and Wasson. Wasson had also claimed Michael's left upper forearm, and another villager named Kakar had claimed the other one. Two other villagers had taken Michael's forearm, and three villagers named Bees, Arem, and Fom had each taken one of his ribs. As for his underwear or his weird shorts, those had been claimed by a man named Anampur, and Michael's glasses had been taken by either Bees or a villager named Dombe. Now, according to the four men telling this story, Michael had been killed and headhunted in response to Max Lepre's raid on the village of Ostjanap four years before. The next morning, Von Piège continued on his rounds, arriving in the village of Zhao, where he was told by his cook that this same story was already being told there. The missionary knew he had to do something and tell someone. Everyone knew about it. In his next village of Biwar Laut, they knew about it there too. So he offered tobacco to some villagers and asked them to bring a letter from him to Agatz. This note was short, but it spoke volumes. Von Piège wrote, quote, Without having the intention of doing so, I stumbled across information and I feel compelled to report this. Michael Rockefeller has been picked up and killed by Otsjanap. Zhao, Biwar, and Omastep are all clearly aware of it. End quote. So, for some clarity in the timeline, both Father Von Piège and Father Von Kessel, in different regions of Azmat territory without speaking to each other by this point, they're hearing the same kind of rumors going around the villages and they both feel compelled to report it to someone, thinking that whoever ends up getting the information would be as shocked as they were and do something about it. When Van Kessel visited Agatz on December 12th, he was shown Von Piège's quick note, which had reached a man named Kor Nijaf, who was the government controller in Agatz. And Van Kessel's like, oh shit, he's hearing the same things I'm hearing. This must be even more proof that it's true. So Van Kessel went to Etch, which was Von Piège's home base, to hear the story from his fellow missionary in person. And then Van Kessel wrote a lengthy report to be delivered to Nijaf back in Agatz. In this report, he gave names, locations, dates, all the information that he and Von Piège had collected amongst them. And then he wrote, quote, The 1% doubt I had has been taken by the very detailed data, which matched with my data and inspections. It is certain that Michael Rockefeller was murdered and eaten by Otsjanap. This was revenge for the shooting four years ago. And in all the villages, people only talk about this heroic act of Otsjanap, and it is known everywhere, end quote. Van Kessel also mentioned that Otsjanep was not going to be having any more government interference, and if anyone showed up to investigate these claims, they would be handled. Van Kessel would continue to send constant reports as he learned more, such as the fact that he had offered two Otsjanep warriors, three steel axes for Michael's head, and two more for his femur, but the Azmat men had declined this offer. They hadn't said, what are you talking about? We don't have these things. They'd just been like, no, we don't want those things. And Van Kessel wrote in his report, all caps, quote, they did not deny the murder, end quote. Behind the scenes, the Dutch government was scrambling, trying to figure out what to do with this information and how to make sure it never got out. On December 21st, the governor of Dutch New Guinea, P.J. Platiel, he sent a cable to Theo Bott, the Minister of the Interior. And this cable was marked secret, with instructions to destroy it after it was read, kind of like Inspector Gadget. Probably a lot of you don't know who Inspector Gadget is, so here's a little refresher. Dr. Claw, planning to steal the treasures of Pharaoh Putatut, must guard artifacts, especially sarcophagus. This message will self-destruct in 30 seconds. 
So when Carl Hoffman found this cable in the archives, he claims that it was partially destroyed, but he could read some of it. And it basically repeated the story. And it said that Michael's skull, bones, and clothing were with people that the missionaries knew by name. Van Kessel and Von Piège had named 15 men who had body parts of Michael's. And they had named another 35 who had been present at the time of Michael's alleged murder. The cable said, quote, Resident also reports that rumors are making the rounds in Morocco about these things already and that it is improbable that the case remains outside the press. In my opinion, some reservations need to be made. No evidence has been found yet, and therefore, there is no certainty yet. In this connection, it doesn't seem germane to me to give information to the press or Rockefeller Sr. at this time. If any questions arise, then we could respond to those by stating that the rumor has reached us too and that it will be investigated. This will gain us some time and enable us in case of confirmation to pick a more favorable moment for publication, end quote. So this cable was sent the day after the Court of Justice in New Guinea announced its intention to register the death of Michael Rockefeller. The cable was also sent the same day that P.J. Platiel officially ended the search for Michael Rockefeller after sending a cable to Nelson Rockefeller telling him, quote, The entire area has been extensively searched by various parties in close cooperation with local inhabitants. Even any rumors were thoroughly investigated. After having examined all reports, I regretfully have to inform you of my decision to end this unsuccessful search as I feel that not anything more can be done, end quote. So Platiel knew that there was a rumor they had not yet looked into, but he told Nelson Rockefeller that they turned over every stone in the search for his son. Why did he do this? Why didn't he just tell Nelson Rockefeller what he knew and then with the combined forces of the Dutch and the United States, they could go to Oetzgenep, they could find the evidence they needed, Michael's skull, for instance, or his glasses or his underwear or any of his belongings. Now, according to Carl Hoffman, it wasn't that easy. And the political nature of everything at that time made the situation even more complicated. In his book, Hoffman writes, quote, If he had been killed and eaten, it wasn't a simple case of one or two guilty men who'd committed a cut-and-dry immoral anomaly and who could be identified and arrested, but a whole village doing what it considered just, carrying on its culture, a culture under intense outside pressure to change at a time when those very cultural elements were being celebrated by people like Nelson Rockefeller and his new museum. Arrest the 15 men named? Arrest all 50 who'd been present? What if they resisted, as they surely would? What if the whole village tried to defend them? How many police and soldiers might be necessary? How many people might die, mowed down by men armed with modern weapons? And if the government did manage to arrest anyone, what then? Subject an illiterate group of naked Stone Age warriors to a moral standard and an administrative process that was totally incomprehensible to them, all while the Dutch insisted they didn't even practice headhunting and cannibalism any longer? Perhaps more important, how were they to deal with the motive? How to admit that the whole thing had been set in motion by Dutch administrative officials themselves, by a Dutch patrol officer's wanton killing of five people? End quote. I read you that whole passage because it's all very important, and it makes a lot of excellent points. How how would they do this, right? Would they dress these azmat men in suits and put them in front of a modern judge and jury? Can you imagine what that would look like, how it would work? Would it work? Probably not. And then you do have this point that the Dutch are trying to show the United States and the world that they had control over their area of New Guinea, that they had civilized the people. And even though many of them still ran around naked and followed their old ways, they were not following the old ways of cutting off people's heads and eating their brains. They're not doing that anymore. The Dutch had at least been able to put a stop to that nonsense. But this trial would show that wasn't necessarily the case. And yes, Max LePray's raid would have to come out because... If they were able to throw these azmat men into court, they would have the right to defend themselves, to explain why they had done what they had done. And that wouldn't paint a very rosy picture of the Dutch government and their management of their colony. The Netherlands were currently telling the UN that everything was good, that their presence in Indonesia was positive, and they were asking for permission to stay there longer. Having this story come out at this time would bring their whole plan crashing down around them. And if they didn't have the support of the U.S., which they probably wouldn't, Once Nelson Rockefeller found out what happened, they would have nothing. So the Dutch did what they felt was their only option, I guess. They they tried to shut it down and shut up Van Kessel and Von Piège. 
these two missionaries were quickly and swiftly silenced. It may sound a bit dramatic, all right, but they were kind of threatened in my opinion. And this came from a man who was the highest Catholic official in Dutch New Guinea, Herman Tilemans. First, a plan was made to quickly replace Father Van Kessel and get him the heck out of Indonesia as soon as possible. So they sent a replacement in, Father Van Die Wow. And then Herman Tilemans wrote a letter to Van Kessel expressing disappointment that Van Kessel hadn't contacted him with this story. And kind of like, um, you know, why did you go over my head? Like, why am I not being the first to hear about this? Which is ridiculous because there's a chain of command that Van Kessel would be expected to follow. And sending a letter directly to Tileman's wouldn't have been a part of that chain of command. In this letter, Tileman's also warned Van Kessel to be, quote, extremely cautious. So you and Father Van Diewel will not get into trouble because of this. And therefore, the mission will not fall from grace with the population. End quote. Now, Carl Hoffman spoke to Father Von Piège in person in 2012, and Von Piège told Hoffman that he had also sent a letter to his bishop, and his bishop would have been Herman Tilemans. And as a result, he was forbidden to talk to anyone about Michael Rockefeller. Von Piège said that he had remained silent out of loyalty to his superiors and probably a little bit of fear, but, quote, the government felt ashamed and the bishop agreed, so the government was always silent and I said nothing. But I have no doubt. I was in Azmat for six years and then in Morocco until 1991, and I am certain, end quote. He's saying he's certain that the, the village of Otsjenap took Michael's life and his head. Carl Hoffman, in his search through the archives, also found a letter from Herman Tilemans to both Von Piège and Von Kessel, which reads, quote, The notes I received from Van Kessel show it as a public secret. Still, nothing is published about it in the newspapers. I would regret it if the first messages to enter the world came from the side of the mission. So I want to ask both of you not to bring into publicity what you know and that which you are convinced of what had happened. Just leave the scoop of talking to someone else. In time, it will be revealed, end quote. Now, Father Von Piège, he wrote back saying, quote, I can understand why they want to keep this hidden from the outside world. However, nobody can convince me that this is not what happened. If the government acts as if it never happened, they are committing a crime. This is my honest conviction, end quote. Go off, Kang. Von Piège was like, hell no. He's like, I'll shut up. But I'm mad about it. Von Piège did stay quiet. Father Van Kessel, however, was not so easily convinced to be a good boy and behave himself. He began telling people that he was going to travel to New York. He was going to find the Rockefeller family and tell them what he knew. He believed they deserved to know. And then whatever they decided to do afterwards, that was up to them. But it was off his conscience. Now, when Herman Tilemans got wind of Van Kessel's plan, he wrote to Van Kessel's boss saying, quote, I want to ask you to make it clear to Father Van Kessel that there has to be absolute discretion regarding the case of Rockefeller. Bringing these sadistic, colored stories into the world is in nobody's interest. He can prove nothing. Leave it to Governor Platil, who is completely informed about all of this and who knows more than Van Kessel can possibly expect. End quote. So basically, Tileman's is saying to Van Kessel, Listen, little boy, you're just a small fish in a big pond. We know all the information. We know more information than you know. It would surprise you. It would blow your mind what we know. Let the people who have the power handle this and go back to your little life and doing what you're supposed to do and being a cog in the machine because we know what's best for everyone. You don't even know the half of it. And frankly, you want the truth, but you can't handle the truth. Shut up, sit down, and stay in your lane. That's how I took those words, at least. And Tilemans went on to say that he would not give his permission for Van Kessel to travel to America, and he strictly forbade Van Kessel from having any correspondence with Nelson Rockefeller or anyone in the Rockefeller family. But Van Kessel, Van Piège, and other people, these missionaries, they were worried what would happen if there was no response to Michael's murder. They were worried about what it would mean for them and other white men who ventured into Azmat territory. And Father Gerard Zagward, you remember him, right? From parts one, part two, our boy Gerard Zagward, he was the first white guy to like hang out with the Azmat for a long time. He also got wind of everything. And he was very concerned too. And he wrote to Albrink Jansen, who was the government official in Morocco, quote, the fact that this hasn't had any consequences, that there hasn't been any reprisal whatsoever, makes them feel free and able to act with arbitrariness in all kinds of circumstances without being punished for it, 
end quote. And when he says them, he means the asthmat, that they feel that they can now do whatever they want and that white men are no longer off limits because before they were afraid, but now they were like, nothing's happening. Let's go ham. Now, as I said, Herman Tilemans was in the process of replacing Father Van Kessel with another missionary, Father Van De Wow. And once this was done and Van Kessel was sent back to the Netherlands, Herman Tilemans began communicating with Father Van De Wow about Michael. Well, mainly he was communicating about keeping any information that Van De Wow may have found out about Michael's disappearance completely under wraps. Tilemans wrote, quote, If you get new information on the case of Rockefeller, then be careful, because this topic is like a cabinet of glass. Of course, as long as there is no proof. One keeps saying he didn't know anything, and rightly so. If you find any proof, don't mention this to anybody. Please, everything, via me. So no messages to other priests or Van Kessel in the Netherlands. Keep silent in the Gats, too. I really ask you to keep this case strictly confidential in separate letters with double envelopes and the word secret written on the inner envelope. Envelope, end quote. Damn, Herman Heilmans. Did he work for the church or the Secret Service? Am I right? Wow. And he's essentially saying, be quiet about all of this unless you find proof and then still be quiet about all of this. You know, just send me whatever you have and then forget you heard it. But I guess what Herman Heilmans was not taking into consideration is there were plenty of other missionaries working throughout the Asmat area. And the rumor was spreading from village to village, so they were going to hear it. Not through Van Kessel or Von Piège, but from the Azmat themselves. And this is exactly what happened in January of 1962, when a Dutch priest named Father Herkman wrote a letter to his parents with a crazy story about the missing Rockefeller man who had been eaten by Azmat villagers in Oostjenep. Herkman said that everyone knew it, and they knew the names of the people responsible. The people responsible still had Michael's head, but no one was willing to go to the village and do something about it because everyone was afraid that they would be killed and eaten as well. Father Herkman's parents were like, whoa, this is some hot tea. So they gave that letter to the Associated Press at the end of March, and the story was printed. But Joseph Lunds, the foreign prime minister, he jumped on it. He immediately responded. He was like, those rumors aren't true. We've heard those rumors. They've been thoroughly investigated. We found them to be false. So you are lying, media. And the day after printing the original story, the media retracted it, and they reported that it wasn't true that they'd made a mistake. But let's go back to Wim van de Wall, the Dutch patrol officer who had sold Michael to Catamaran, and he was the guy who the Oostjenep villagers had delivered building materials to before allegedly spearing Michael Rockefeller and taking his head. So van de Wall was given instructions from the Dutch government to quietly look into the rumors. He did not tell the villagers in Oostjenep that he was there about Michael, but he did build a police post in the village, and then he started, you know, the process of becoming close with the Azmat men there so that they would let their guard down. He worked side by side with the Azmat people in Oostjenep. He helped them repair homes, build bridges. He brought gifts for the women and children. And he spent long days and nights smoking in the U with the men, talking about anything and everything except Michael Rockefeller. After some time of this, Van de Wall did start bringing up stories that he'd heard of like head hunting that the tribe used to do. And he was told, yes, they were true. In fact, they still do some head hunting here and there. Van de Wall had been there for a few months when he finally asked about Michael, telling the men that nothing they said would leave the U. In May of 1962, Van de Wall wrote a letter to Herman Tilemans telling him, quote, the answer fell right out of their mouths, end quote. Van de Wall wrote that the men had told him all the details, and some did vary from the original story in regards to, like, who had done the, the stabbing and where Michael's bones had ended up, but it was pretty much the same otherwise. He also told Herman Tilemans that, from what he had seen and heard, the men of this village were still participating in headhunting raids, and earlier that same month, two women from a small village nearby had been killed by warriors from Oostjenep. After being in the village for three months, Van Van Wall was able to convince the villagers to tell him what had happened to Michael and show him where Michael's remains were. Now, Carl Hoffman spoke to Wim Van Wall in person in 2012, and he was told that the villagers led Van Wall into the jungle. They dug in the ground. They removed a skull and some bones. 
The skull had no lower jaw, and there was a hole in the right temple indicating that it had been headhunted and the brains had been removed to be eaten. Van D. Wall immediately radioed Ebrink Jansen and told him about what he had, you know, the skull, and a patrol officer from Agatz was sent to Oatschnep to pick up the skull and bones from Van De Wall. Now, after that, Van D. Wall claims he never heard another word about Michael Rockefeller besides from a man, an ironwood dealer who had been with the patrol officer from Agatz when the bones had been handed over. This man claimed that the bones had been given to Jensen. Jansen then gave them to a dentist in Morocco. They were then sent to Holland, and then who knows? Van de Waal was never asked to testify about what he had seen. He was never asked to write a report. He never was asked to talk about it. And whenever he saw Ebrink Jansen after that, it was not brought up. But Van de Waal has been curious about it all of these years, asking, quote, why are there no government records? If there was no proof, it would have cost the government nothing to just tell the truth, that we'd spent three months in Oatsgenep and had tried, but they did nothing, because the truth would have been very bad for the Dutch case, and that's why they wanted it kept secret, end quote. It might have had something to do with the timing, right? Van de Waal had turned the skull and bones over in June of 1963, and the following September, the UN ratified the New York Agreement, which transferred Dutch New Guinea to a UN Temporary Executive Authority, and then to Indonesia eight months later. The Dutch were then sent away from New Guinea, and maybe they felt, you know, whatever had happened there, it was no longer their concern or their responsibility. Carl Hoffman believes that it all makes sense. He feels that when Michael left the catamaran on the morning of November 19, 1961, he would have been no further than nine and a half miles from shore, maybe even closer. That same day, the 19th, a group of men from Oatsjanep were returning home, and based on the time that they had left Piramapun, they would have been nearing the mouth of the Utah River early on the morning of November 20th. If Michael had been swimming at a rate of half a mile an hour, he would have been close to the mouth of that same river early on the morning of November 20th. Based on the tide tables for that morning, the water near the river had reached its highest point at 8 a.m., which would have helped Michael reach the shore. From Hoffman's conversations with the Azmat people in New Guinea, he has information that the men who were in their canoes on the river that morning were related to the men killed in the raid of Max Lepre. Hoffman writes, quote, The Azmat were known to be opportunists, preferring victims to be alone and unprotected, and Michael would have been exhausted, vulnerable in a way they'd never encountered in a white man before. And he'd been in the village already. They would have known him and may have remembered his name, an important factor in choosing a headhunting victim, end quote. Because remember, whoever gets the skull for like their initiation right takes on the name of the victim. So yeah, it helps if you know what this person's name is. So I feel like all we need to do now is just go to the Azmat villages and walk around and ask everybody their name until somebody responds Michael Rockefeller. That was a bad joke, I'm sorry. Hoffman needed to find out what had actually happened to Michael's bones, his skull, his underwear, his glasses. He does not believe that what Van de Waal gave the Dutch government was actually Michael's remains because Carl Hoffman feels that the Azmat wouldn't have parted with these things as they would have been considered sacred. So in March of 2012, Carl Hoffman went to Oatsgenep himself to investigate now that the men who were involved in Michael's alleged murder would be long gone. They'd be dead. Maybe people would be more willing to talk since, you know, no one's going to get in trouble. That's a Western perspective, though, right? Like, oh, my father killed a bunch of people, but he's dead now and it wasn't me and I had nothing to do with it. So I'm not going to get into trouble. But with the asthma, it's a lot different. Um, and I'm just kind of putting that together now as I'm talking about it. They have these very strong family ties, these very strong um, alliance ties that have a lot to do with your family and who your family is friends with. So it would be, at least amongst themselves, you would be held responsible for the sins of your father, right? Like if your father had taken a life, you're going to reciprocate that on whoever's left to reciprocate it against, if that makes sense. So yeah, they would have felt like, I don't care if like those dudes are dead. We don't want any of this nonsense here. We don't want you guys affiliating the village of Oostjanap with the murder of like a very rich and influential white man. We still don't want to talk about it. So it was kind of like a weird experience. Carl Hoffman's time, at least his first time in Oostjanap. They were both weird experiences because he went there twice and he spent time there twice. Um, 
it depended on who he was talking to. And he had an interpreter with him, right? So some people would say like, yeah, we know about Michael Rockefeller. Some people would be like, yeah, we heard he was killed by men from Ochnep. Some people would say like, oh, we heard he drowned. We know this story. But whenever there was a lot of people around, like in a group, everyone would sort of just stick to the narrative. Like, we don't know anything. We weren't alive. We weren't there. We have no clue what you're talking about. We know nothing. Leave us alone, pretty much. So Carl Hoffman was brought to a man named Tepep, who was the current leader of Oats Janep and the son of Pep, who, if you remember, was the Azmat warrior who allegedly stabbed Michael with a spear. Now, Hoffman's interpreter and his guide, Amates, he told Tepep, and the rest of the gathered villagers that everyone in America already knew what had happened to Michael Rockefeller. They knew that Pep had stabbed him. They knew that Pep had, you know, been the one who had done it and the rest of the villagers had, like, gone along with it. But it had been a long time ago and there was nothing to be afraid of now. The new leader to Pep, Pep's son, he agreed, like, yeah, this did happen a long time ago, which means that no one here currently remembers what actually went down. You know, so leave us alone. <laughs> Hoffman said that at this time, everyone was very nervous, and he was told by Amates that they were scared. But two men mentioned that they knew the story. However, they were afraid to talk about it for fear that the American army would descend on their homes. Carl Hoffman also heard a rumor that Michael's glasses were still in Oztjenep in the possession of Dombey's family. Dombey was one of the original villagers who was allegedly in those canoes when Michael was stabbed. There was an old man there in the village of Oztjenep when Carl Hoffman was there, and he kept trying to tell Hoffman something. But, you know, there was always, like, people around, and then they would go to, like, have a little bit more privacy, and people would follow them. And when he finally got him alone and he was about to tell him something, the leader... Tapap interfered. And Tapap said, listen, like, we all knew that Michael was on his way to visit our village when his boat overturned, and he vanished. But that's basically all we know. We don't know anything else, and if we did know anything else, we would be too afraid to say it. Now, this went on for several days, right? Hoffman would think he was getting somewhere. The older villagers seemed like they had something to say, but nothing concrete ever came of it. So he left the village, and he traveled around a bit before he received word from Amates, his interpreter and his guide, that a villager in Otsjinep named Kokai, who was old and who was related to Dambe in some way, Kokai had Michael's glasses. According to Hoffman, Michael wore 1960s era glasses with big black frames and thick lenses, which is something we can see from Michael's pictures. Now, the glasses that this man, Kokai, had they were not Michael's glasses. They had been made in the 1990s, and they just couldn't have possibly belonged to Michael Rockefeller. And Carl Hoffman was frustrated, and he began to question everything that he believed was true about what had happened to Michael Rockefeller. Maybe now that everyone involved was dead, the story of what had happened to Michael had been passed down like folklore, and the people who now lived in Otsjinep, they really didn't know anything. But Kokai, the man who had claimed to have Michael's glasses, he was very old, and he'd been alive in 1961. He'd even been around in 1958 for Max LaPrey's raid. And when Hoffman decided to give it another shot and make another journey into Azmat territory, during that trip, he spent a lot of time with Kokai. In fact, he basically lived with him. Kokai told Hoffman that four of the villagers killed in Max LaPrey's raid had been the most important men in Oztjenep at that time, and they'd been replaced by Finn, Ajim, Pep, Jizar, and Jane. Hoffman also found out that a cholera epidemic had raged through Azmat territory in November of 1962, a year after Michael had vanished. And the village of Otsnajep had been specifically hit hard, losing more than 70 people. Carl Hoffman wondered if in the mind of the Azmat, the cholera outbreak had been perceived as being a punishment for the murder of Michael Rockefeller. Because remember, we talked about why the tribes in New Guinea didn't really attack white people because they didn't know what they were dealing with, with a white person. You know, they didn't know what kind of repercussions were going to come, what kind of punishment was going to ensue. If a death always has to be avenged, how is this white man's death going to be avenged? We're used to killing our own, and we know exactly how we operate when that happens. How do his people operate? So this cholera outbreak happens, and I mean, 70 people dead in a very tight-knit village like that, it's going to be impactful. And so maybe the Azmat people were like, oh, here is our punishment. This is how we are repaid for the death of this white man. At the end of a month-long visit, Kokai told Hoffman that there was a story in Azmat that Michael had been speared by Finn and Pep, 
But that was all he knew. So while Carl Hoffman was there, one night the Asmat men were dancing and chanting and Hoffman was sort of like watching from afar. They didn't really see him there on the outskirts because it was dark outside and they had the fire in front of them. And Hoffman grabbed his camera to record their dancing. And it was kind of like a story was being told through the dance because they were sort of chanting and, and telling a story as they were doing this ritual. But the dancing stopped shortly after Hoffman hit record, and all he got was eight minutes of an older asthmat man named Marco finishing a story that they had been telling during their dancing. Later, when Hoffman was back in Agatz and with his interpreter, Amates, Hoffman was showing Amates the footage, and Amates told Hoffman that what he had thought was Marco telling a story was actually Marco delivering a warning to those gathered around him about the story that had just been told during the dancing. And this is what Marco said, quote, Don't you tell this story to any other man or any other village because this story is only for us. Don't speak. Don't speak and tell the story. I hope you remember it and you must keep this for us. I hope, I hope this is for you and only you. Don't talk to anyone forever, to other people or another village. If people question you, don't answer. Don't talk to them because this story is only for you. If you tell it to them, you'll die. I am afraid you will die. You'll be dead. Your people will be dead if you tell this story. You keep this story in your house to yourself, I hope, forever. Forever, I hope, and I hope. If any man comes and has questions for you, don't you talk. Don't talk. Today, tomorrow, and for every day. Day, you must keep this story. Even for a stone axe or a necklace of dog's teeth, do not ever share this story. End quote. But whatever story had been told during the dancing and, and the ritual by the fire, um, Hoffman hadn't gotten that recorded. So we don't know. No evidence of Michael Rockefeller has ever been found. Not his glasses, not his skull, not his underwear. And if he did drown in the Arafora Sea, his body never washed up on shore, nor did that second red gas tank he had tied to himself wash up on shore. After his disappearance, the Rockefellers began taking the steps to declare Michael legally dead. More than 500 Azmat artifacts were shipped uh, from New Guinea to New York City, and these were objects that Michael had essentially given his life to collect. And in the summer of 1962, those items were assigned a value of $285,000. Less than a year after Michael disappeared, the Museum of Primitive Art launched a massive exhibit in a specifically built pavilion located at 16 West 54th Street. The exhibit was called Art of Azmat, and they charged 50 cents per person for admission. And the New York Times wrote, quote, Mounted to represent a native village, the entire tan bark floored pavilion is dominated by 12 fantastic sculptured ancestor poles, some more than 20 feet high, of dramatic design and amazing form, which Papuan tribesmen or Asmats are deeply concerned with because it is through them that they appease the spirits of their ancestors, end quote. The papers praised the exhibit. They called it the legacy of a young man with a boyish enthusiasm for life and an unquenchable desire for knowledge of people in strange and remote places. On December 19, 1976, Nelson Rockefeller was sworn in as the 41st Vice President of the United States. And soon after this, he met with the Australian Prime Minister, Go Whitlam, at the White House. Now, Nelson thanked Australia for their help in the search for his son. And Whitlam mentioned, you know, your son, his disappearance is technically still a mystery. You know, what, what do you think about that? Which I think is a little tactless, but... <laughs> Go off. He probably wanted to know just as much as we do what Nelson Rockefeller was, you know, thinking about Michael's disappearance at this point after all of these rumors had come out. So Nelson Rockefeller, the father who had previously insisted that his son was in great shape and a strong swimmer, now he seemed to feel differently. And Nelson Rockefeller responded, I believe there is no question you can't swim 12 miles against the current, end quote. So what do you think happened to Michael Rockefeller? Did he meet his fate with a group of headhunters? Did he integrate into a native tribe and live the rest of his days listening to the mice run along his thatched roof hut? Did he drown as he tried to swim 10, 12, or you know, 15 miles to shore? Was he attacked by a blood-hungry alligator or shark? Let me know in the comments. I will tell you that 
it's it's a tough one to sort of decipher, but I do think that um, anybody who sort of makes the decision to go into these uncontacted civilizations sort of has to pay the price for whatever happens as a result. We can't take our rules and our laws that we've created in our own cultures and our own societies and put them onto other people who didn't agree to that, who didn't sign up for it. You know, the Azmat people, the Dani people, they live by their own rules and those rules dictate the way they behave in their own society. They didn't ask anybody to show up in the jungles and start imposing their rules and laws on them. They didn't vote for these people. They didn't agree to these laws. And as far as they're concerned, they have nothing to do with them. So I do think that anybody who wants to sort of go off and visit with these people, observe them, learn about them, benefit monetarily off of them, right? Because Michael's over here giving these people tobacco and pieces of string and stone axes and stuff. And what he gathered from them ended up being worth almost $300,000, you know, benefiting off of them. If they want to do that, they need to understand the dangers and they need to understand that you're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. And there's a whole different set of rules and laws here that you really need to truly understand before you just go skipping off into the jungle. And that's where I stand on it. Of course, I feel bad. Whatever happened to him, I feel bad because I think that he would have gone on to do great things and he would have gone on to probably become more sensitive, have more understanding and maybe, you know, bridge a gap that was there. But that unfortunately didn't happen. And I'm not sure what I think happened to him. Either he did drown or he was headhunted. It's not out of the question. I mean, there was a lot of people in the Azmat villages who were talking about that, who were spreading their rumor around, and they definitely seemed afraid to talk to people about it. So it's very possible. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thank you so much for being here. I know this probably was a long one. It's going to be a pain to edit, but I appreciate you sticking with me through this three-part series. Um, follow me on social media. All the links are in the description. Don't forget to check out my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company, the best coffee ever in the whole world, I promise you. And don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with uh, retired police detective Derek Levesseur. We're covering a great case on there now that's got us really having some discussions and going places I didn't think we were going to go. So go in the description box to look for all of that stuff. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very soon soon. So you got to let it go I got